dear audience, thank you for staying with us. I'm joined today by Claudia Selli, Vice President for European Government Affairs at at t who is also one of the partners of the European Ideas Forum. So Claudia, welcome. Thank you very much for being here with us. We are here to have a short chat about transatlantic cooperation in the age of artificial intelligence. So I will dive in directly into uh, the questions. My first question to you is, how do you see EU's progress when it comes to digital infrastructure development and overall connectivity? And what are the biggest bottlenecks, in your opinion, that the EU should overcome? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for having me here uh, today. And I wanted to um, start by um, also explaining that uh, AT&T, as you might know, um, has the primary uh, consumer footprint in the US and in Mexico. Elsewhere, in about 220 countries, including the EU, we have primarily enterprise solutions. Uh, so Europe is, of course, an important market. And uh, I should say as well, not only from an operational perspective, but from a regulatory standpoint. As everybody knows, uh, you know, Europe has really uh, been taking the lead in adopting regulatory framework that have an impact on our industry as with extraterritorial outreach and also prompting the bait at global level on many, many issues. And so this is really uh, important and it's important that private sector together uh, with governments uh, work hand in hand in order uh, to advance a, a certain uh, policy framework that would allow innovation uh, that create growth, uh, investment, and also that are um, consistent at global level and, uh, and, and certainly that are predictable. This is very important for industries. In terms to your question, I think what's important to drive you know, the infrastructure is certainly uh, having and adopting smart uh, spectrum policies. Uh, spectrum is really the lifeblood of our industry and so it's important to allow um, the greater sharing, greater harmonized rules also at European level and, uh, and then uh, certainly you know, creating these, uh, this framework that are not too predictive, uh, predictive but at, uh, that's a prescriptive, I wanted to say, but at the same time very flexible um, in terms of how you reach the objective. Um, so in, in other important uh, or potential barrier that can slow down uh, the development and deployment uh, of the infrastructure, I would say certainly data localization measures are not uh, helpful. But Europe has, leading, uh, has been leading in this respect because you not only allows uh, the data to flow freely in the EU, but also you know, has very recently uh, adopted the adequacy decision with the US, uh, allowing for this uh, data privacy framework to uh, enter into force. So all of that certainly is important. Uh, I would say then um, when governments uh, and countries look also at the data of their citizens, it's important to have harmonized rules when it comes to law enforcement procedure and processes so that the burden doesn't fall uh, all on the uh, industry. And finally, when we talk about new technologies such as AI, I would say that it's important because it's a very flexible rule to have uh, flexible frameworks that allow uh, this technology to unleash its potential while mitigating risks uh, um, so we need to have a nu nuanced risk-based approach uh, in an ideal world, and it's important that you and US work together on that. And we'll come back to, to monitoring and mitigating AI, uh, AI risks just later on. But as a follow-up question to everything you listed just now, um, is the EU's digital decade uh, policy program and the funding that is uh, available um, sufficient for these goals, you know, for, for everything that, uh, that you just mentioned? Do we need more when it comes to designated investment uh, and strategy? Yeah, thank you, Anna. I would say that I'm probably not the best person to uh, comment on how much funding is needed, not only because my, of my numeracy uh, skills, but also because, uh, you know, we don't have consumer uh, operation in Europe. So I would leave probably the funding part more to our European colleagues simply because they're best, best fitted to, un to talk about their needs. But I would say, having read the report of the digital decade, it seems that there's still need to improve certain 
certain areas when it comes to um, you know skills adoption, ICT as well workers uh, and, and and so there's and all the digital transformation. But I think everything is uh, very much interlinked because if you think about some of the policies that I have listed, this will enable you know the return on investment and to companies to invest more in the infrastructure and hence to be able and develop the skills, invest in the skills, invest in uh, the digital transformation. So everything is very much interlinked into uh, this ecosystem. And so it's important to create a competitive uh, and innovative and vibrant uh, ecosystem in this respect. Uh, let's talk about AT&T's experience in 5G deployment. So what are, in your opinion, the biggest lessons learned from AT&T's uh, 5G deployment in North America? And how can the EU pick up uh, the pace in, the, in, in rolling out the next generation infrastructure? Yeah, thank you. When, when it comes to 5G, uh, AT&T is really building in this respect in the sense that uh, we have invested a lot in our network uh, and we have covered 95% of the population and all the territories where we are present. Um, the lessons learned, as I have been saying, in certain, uh, certainly having the policy framework at disposal that allow you to invest in broadband, smart uh, spectrum policy. In fact, we have uh, been seeing that if you want to use Spectrum as an enabler for economy, there's been a strong push from operators, satellite operators, and, and, and other stakeholders to allow greater spectrum sharing. And so it's important also to look at the method on how you share spectrum, but also uh, the bands that you allocate uh, to that in order to have a clear path on how you build a pipeline for the future. Um, then, uh, you know, as I have been saying, um, all of that uh, is, is important. Uh, and once you have this policy framework at disposal that are flexible, I think it's also easy or easier uh, to invest into the broadband for, uh, for the future. Thank you, uh, Claudia. We cannot talk about EU-US uh, cooperation without, of course, mentioning the Trade and Technology Council, TTC. Uh, so the EU-US uh, Trade and Technology Council was seen as one of the most important and tangible platforms for improving the transatlantic relations on many topics. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the progress remained uh, quite slow, even though the aspirations were set very, very high. Uh, so, in your opinion, what are the fields that have most appetite for additional cooperation uh, and joint progress between the EU and the US? Yeah, and I would concur with you. I totally agree that the TTC has been really an instrument um, and, and very critical to improving the relation between the EU and US because you have a forum with a set of people uh, that can uh, talk to each other, coordinate on important policy uh, frameworks. There's been as well a lot of uh, other distraction issues, um, you know, in, in terms of geopolitical tensions or geopolitical issues to be resolved, which distracted a little bit from the TTC see, but all in all, uh, I think also those policies sometimes require time in terms of, uh, you know, achieving res concrete results. One of the policies where uh, certainly progress has been uh, there and there's room for collaboration, as I have been saying, uh, is certainly AI. Uh, in fact, in May uh, 2023, Fersager announced uh, the EU-US Code of Conduct, um, where the idea is to build principle among uh, that are shared by the two countries countries, and certainly a high with this potential, you know, to uh, have uh, a great impact on the economy, on jobs. Uh, I think it's really a topic where there's a lot of, uh, of appetite to cooperate uh, on. And so it's also important to include the private sector because the private sector has the most experience in, these, uh, in this respect. At at and for example, in 2019, and now today we have revisited our principles for AI, which uh, can be summarized in terms of uh, for the people, by the people, secure, uh, ethical, so and accessible. So all of that are principles that we uh, respect and try to put forward, and generally are good practice, um, sp speaking broadly. Uh, you anticipated my next question, which was, what is the role, indeed, of the private sector in providing support for uh, EU-US uh, priorities in TTC or other initiatives? And, you know, how is there enough 
uh, right now cooperation between the private sector and the institutions on these topics and you know can it be improved? I guess the answer is always <laughs> yes. Uh, but what would you like to see you know, from the private sector in the cooperation with the institutions on these topics? Yeah, well, first of all, um, you know, to AT&T, we've been working, for example, on, on AI since 1950. We have 1,000 patents, and so a lot of expertise. And, and, and that's why it's important to involve the private sector on the TTC front, but also on other uh, cooperation, because you can uh, certainly share the area of concerns. You can share, uh, you know, what works, what doesn't work, or what could hinder potentially the development and deployment of operation or of the technology. Um, so, yes, the private sector is involved in TTC. Uh, to your question, there's always room for improvement in anything we do. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, having uh, a clear and transparent dialogue uh, and uh, understand where the outputs as well go, I think it would be uh, important uh, that, that there's continued involvement. Uh, there have been some fora, of course, uh, where the CEOs, including the CEO of at and has been part in the TTC now in, in uh, Stockholm, for example. Um, but then, you know, this has to be a continued, I think, dialogue and a continued uh, inclusion. So it would, uh, in an ideal world, you know, just not um, simply uh, here and there, but uh, a sort of uh, an ongoing and continued dialogue into the development of these technologies. Thank you, uh, Claudia, for the insights. I, uh, I would like to finish with a question on artificial intelligence risks, uh, what you mentioned before. How important is EU-US cooperation, and you know, is it uh, already doing enough on not only identifying and assessing existing risks, but also emerging risks of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I would say that technologies know no borders, right? So uh, the EU-US cooperation is essential, and the global cooperation as well is really critical. The G7, for example, or the OECD are working on AI, and, uh, and certainly a risk-based approach is what probably works best because in most cases AI is used also to improve the efficiency of the business, to uh, improve the processes internal uh, in the business, and so in certain cases it's not particularly harmful. Uh, so a nuanced and risk-based approach is what, uh, from our perspective, would work best. And uh, I think the EU and US have to go hand in hand because if you adopt different frameworks, then it's really difficult to implement. It's really difficult to uh, see the technology, you know, uh, develop and unleash the full potential. And I would say that those principles, in an ideal world, it would be even better to have it at global level. Thank you, uh, thank you, Claudia, for, uh, for having this fascinating chat with us on the transatlantic operation, for sharing your insights also from the uh, private uh, sector perspective and underlining the importance of cooperation between institutions and private sector and, and sharing also lessons learned from at and Thank you for uh, being here with us. And once again, at and is one of the partners of the European uh, Ideas Forum. And I'd now like to pass the floor back to Sandra.